All right, um, I know I'm using the um, same PowerPoint as the first lesson, um, but um, this is actually the last lesson of the subject class. I um, just wanted to make reference of a few things that I didn't really touch on that much. Um, the first is um, James talks about um, true religion. The, the, the epistle of James talks about true religion as it applies to the church. And one of the things that he says is religion that finds no fault with God is religion that takes care of care of these needy people, the, the, the widows and the orphans. And, 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 and it also is keeping yourself unstained from the world. And I think that that so much sums it up. You know, that faith without works is dead. It's not, it's not real faith. When there is a genuine faith in the Lord, there, there are works that follow. Not the works of the law that Paul talked about, but the works of the Spirit that Paul talked about. You see, when we're saved, the Holy Spirit begins a work in us, and he starts changing us. And as he's changing us, thing, things in our lives change. And so we become different people. And that's a sign of true religion. Okay? If someone says they are a Christian and they live however they want, that's not true. Because the faith, true faith, will always, will always create those works as a follow-up. Um, another thing is that when we sin, when we choose to sin, when we choose to live in sin, this causes us to become prideful and distant. When we choose to sin, it causes us to put up a wall between us and God. Not that God went anywhere, but we are choosing to disobey God. And as we continue in that disobedience, we eventually fall in a place of disbelief, of apathy, of, of just not caring, of just not, um, not being into it. And our hearts is not into it. But as we follow the Spirit's lead, as we do those things that He tells us to, to do and stop living for the world and stop living by the world's standards, a change happens in our heart and we become more content, we become more loving, we become more outward focused. See, but when, when we choose to live in a sin, we become all about me. I'm going to be the best person that I can be and I'm going to do this and, and you know, I'm going to... I'm gonna. I'm not gonna take that from anybody, and and uh, I'm my own person. And see, we all we get all focused on us. That's what sin does. Sin produces more sin. It leads you to do more sin. I'll give you another example. One guy was irritated because uh, he had done something really stupid at work, and he had sinned at work, if you will. And then when he got he he got mad at himself because he sinned once again sin led to more sin which now you see the anger taking root and then when he got home he unleashed fury on his wife see what I mean an escalating situation because of sin and that's what sin does now that but sin 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 causes us to reproduce a sin let's say for instance you're stuck in alcoholism or, or pornography or whatever it really doesn't matter um, you're gonna do that thing and Eventually, at some point, you're going to feel good about it at first. It's, it's, I forget what they call it, but, but think of an imaginary line here, okay? And here's you, and something happens, so you feel bad. So you do, you do this thing that you're addicted to, which makes you feel better, but then because you did it, you feel bad, and so it kind of repeats itself, but the thing is, as it repeats itself, it goes down and down. This line represents the threshold of pleasure, okay? So eventually, you may have started out up here where you actually enjoyed the thing, but eventually it's going to come down here where you're not even enjoying the thing anymore. You're just bound to the thing. Okay? Are you looking at porn and you're thinking, I don't even enjoy this anymore? So you mean that, that, that dissatisfaction leaves, and this le leads you to either escalate the situation where you're going to look at more porn or more, more advanced porn or maybe... Um, rape someone or something like that, see what I mean? Oh, or maybe take out violence on someone. So, I mean, an escalating situation to make it more exciting, or you're going to um, stop doing it. Um, obviously, gradually. But um, it, it's, it's, that, it's the very simple idea that, that sin creates more sin. So, you, 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 let's say you're looking at porn or whatever, okay? And... <sighs> You are sad because you looked at porn or whatever. Maybe you're lonely. Roll with me on this. 
and now you're going to look at porn because you're sad. So I mean, so it, doing that thing is going to cause you to reproduce that thing, but it's also going to cause you to reproduce sins in general. It's going to cause you to multiply your sins. And James talks about this. If you draw a brother back, you save him from a multitude of sins. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is don't choose to live in sin. And eventually, if you sin long enough, you'll reach this conclusion. Oh, God will forgive me. It's okay, it's okay because God will forgive me. Um, once again, just the idea that you have that going through your heart shows that you're not truly repenting. True repentance is turning from. Okay, to repent means to turn from, meaning that you're turning from your sin and you are turning towards God, okay? Um, or you reach another place where you, where you, as you're living in sin, where you, where you say something along the lines of this, no one can forgive me. So I mean, because you've continued in sin, your mind's patterns start thinking wrong. And you start believing your wrong thinking patterns because sin causes us to think differently. Why does the world condone the things that it does? Because our conscience becomes seared, okay, which is one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is it revives that in us. Religion should be the thing that's paving right and wrong, um, not by necessarily, um, you know, bombing abortion clinics or stuff like that, but I'm talking about... Um, by the way that we live, by the things that we stand up for, should, you know, make an impact there. Uh, our prayers should make a big impact. Um, so more sin leads to sin, which leads to irritation, which leads to um, uh, more sin, which leads to guilt. I mean, it's a never-ending cycle of, 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 of reproduced problems. Um, so just a few more things. Uh, another thing is that the body was meant to be diverse. See, nowadays we have the Lutheran Church, the Catholic Church, we have the, uh, the Pentecostals, we have the Methodists, we have all kinds of different people, and then within those people, we have, you know, we try to reproduce where everybody's like this. See what I mean? So we, we've separated ourselves into cliques now. It's not even a matter of who's right and who's wrong, it's a matter of cliques. We all have just slightly different beliefs, just slightly different beliefs. We're not talking about Jehovah's Witness and Pentecostals. We're talking about Baptists and Pentecostals. So, I mean, we're putting huge gaps between people who believe in the same God, the same salvation. Just minor details are different. Minor details are different. And the thing is, is are we honestly so arrogant that we think we have full knowledge about everything? And every, every denomination is doing this. Not every denomination, but you get what I'm saying. So lately there's this idea of ecumenical or ecumen ecumenicism, I think is what it's called. Um, and, 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 and so what, what this is called, um, the ecumenical movement is how I know it, which is why I don't know the other form of that word. Um, and, and people take this too far. Some people say all churches everywhere we need to be united. Well, no, because not all churches are true churches. You know, there's a lot of places that, I mean, like for instance, um, an Islamic mosque wouldn't be good to combine with a, you know, Christian church. See what I mean? Um, the Mormons wouldn't be good to, to, to combine with Jehovah's Witness. See what I mean? It's just, it's just not good. There's the true church, which is people who serve Jesus Christ and who, who you know, they're his disciples. Okay? They serve God, and they believe that he's the only way to salvation. And then there's the cults, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Christian Science. And then there's um, just different religions in total, like Hinduism, Buddhism, that kind of stuff. Um, Islam. Um, and, and, and so the body was meant to be diverse, but it's not meant to take in people who aren't actually part of the body. So what does that mean? That means there shouldn't be a white church. There shouldn't be a black church. There should be a community church. Are there black people in your community? Then you should have black people in your church. Do you have white people in your community? Then you should have white people in your... See what I mean? We don't need to be separating people. The body is about unity. There is no longer slave nor, or, 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 um, slave nor free. There's no longer Greek nor, nor, uh, nor Jew. There's no longer male nor female. There, we're, we're all one under Christ. Now, to say that we don't have different roles or positions, like, for instance, the, head, the man being the head of the household, but that doesn't mean that um, we don't have places for people. So this person um, is more Pentecostal, let's say, and this person is a little more maybe spiritually reserved, if you will. Um, and so what we do is we say, okay, so they need to go to different churches. This person needs to go to more of a Pentecostal church. This one needs to go to more of maybe like Baptist or, I don't know, 
whatever. See what I mean? And so we start separating people when the truth is that we it wasn't like that originally. Okay, it was meant to be one body. What does that mean for us? That means we need to work with each other. If we serve the same God, we need to be serving the same God. See, we don't need to allow the petty squabbles to keep us from from um, what God has given to us. Okay, our communities are seeing a divided church. They're seeing people squabbling over things that don't matter, and they need to see people who stand up for something. See, Christians, for the longest time, were known for making an impact on the community. Nowadays, they're known for, oh, they're the people who hate homosexuals. Oh, they're the people who picket funerals. Oh, they're the picket and people who, who are always saying something really stupid on social media. See, we don't need to be known as those people. <laughs> Goodness sakes, we don't. We need to be known as the people who are hanging out with sinners, who are, who are telling them about, about a God who loves them. We need to be the people who initiate things in our community. I just posted on Twitter the, the other day. Our church is starting a, a youth recreation and tutoring center. Why? Because no one else cares. They may say that they care, but they're not doing anything about it. Kids in our community need somewhere to go. So either you can sit around and twiddle your thumbs and say about everything in your community that you want to be just like you want it to be, or you can see a need and do that. We're starting a men's center not because there's a bunch of people who are getting wanting to get off of drugs and nobody cares. So there's some of them who are who, who get saved in prison, but then they go back to their old life and they fall back into drugs. So what we're going to do is instead of having them fall back to their, to their old life when they're genuinely saved, um, we're going to start discipling them in this men's center. See what I mean? Why? Because no one else is doing it. See, that's what the church needs to do. Step up and do something in the community. We don't need to be squabbling about how to have the perfect service, how to have the perfect pews, exactly how we want. No. We need to be stepping up and saying this is what Christ would have done. He would have seen a need and he would have loved on people in whatever way he could have. See, and he told us to go. And so what we've done is we've thought the only way to witness to the world was by banging on their door and telling them, hey, you need to accept Jesus Christ right now. I'm not going to show you his love. I'm not going to prove to you that Christ is different than any of the other religions. I'm just going to demand that you meet me on my terms. Think of how we witness to people. We always use the Bible. Well, what if they don't believe in the Bible? See what I mean? Get with them on their terms. Do they believe in science? Then show how science points to God. Do they believe in evolution? Then show how evolution points to God. Do they believe in, 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 in Hinduism? Do they believe in, in, in whatever? Meet them on their terms and show who God really is. Bring them from where they are to where they to where they need to be. And that's what it's about dealing with dealing with drug addicts and stuff. You see them where they are, but you don't want them to stay there. You want them, you want to work character on them. You want to bring them to another place. And that's largely what this discipleship course has in mind. Um, 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 also. Um, so we're meant to be one church, um, meant to be one church. And you know, um, I, I want you not to miss the point. Um, I'm going to say this and talk about this in a minute, but like for instance, Bill Gothard in 2014 was accused of some, some things and stepped down. Um, and, and so a lot of people would say, you know, oh, Bill Gothard, this, Bill Gothard, that, and they'll totally miss the point of this class. Or they'll hear what I just said about the church being one, and they'll totally miss the point um, and, and think that I'm trying to say something that I'm not. So, I mean, don't miss the point. Even if you don't agree with everything that I said, see the big picture and try to learn something. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, also, um, with pride, I talked about this a little bit. Pride is not necessarily pride in self. See, we've for too long thought that pride means only having pride in yourself. Oh, well, he's a prideful person. But you can also have pride in other things, like you're hurt. Oh, I don't go to church anymore because that church I was hurt at a church. No, you're being prideful against God. You're just using a, a, a hurt to be prideful against God rather than yourself. Okay, There's different kinds of pride, and there's different focus of pride. The only way to true humility is a focus on Christ. When you compare yourself to Christ and his character, you start seeing your shortcomings. And you start seeing, you know what, I'm not that much better than, than that other person. See, what we do is, is we, we make ourselves feel better about sin. I'm not a child molester. 
he's a child monster, you know. Oh, so I'm so much better than him. Are you still given to fits of rage, to fits of lust? Do you look at porn? Do you cheat on your wife? This is the exact same thing that he did. See what I mean? He, he gave himself over to the lust of the flesh. And yet you're holding yourself so much higher than him because you're giving yourself to the lust of the flesh in a different way. See what I mean? James says, for, for those who don't give mercy, there will be no mercy shown because mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment. See, we completely pass over that, that verse. We are, we're not called to judge the actions of the world. We're called to judge ourselves, to judge the church. Do you know what I mean? But to do it not in a judgmental spirit, but in a loving spirit. See, but we always take things to the extremes. Either we judge everyone or we judge no one. So our church has all kinds of bad, immoral things happening, and we just let it go. Or we hop down everybody's throat about everything. Uh, oh, this person's, I mean, I, I, he's not wearing a tie today. Do you honestly think Paul wore a tie when he was going around going around the um, the Roman world? I don't think so. I, as far as I know, he was probably just wearing you know regular clothes, and they probably didn't dress up for for the for the synagogue. I would imagine they probably just wore their regular clothes. Especially seems the high rate of of of, of uh, poor people in that time. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. Um, so don't think that pride is simply a pride in your having a prideful attitude in yourself. Pride is anything that keeps us from seeking the Lord. Pride is anything that keeps us from seeking the Lord. I'm a pretty good person. Pride. Um, oh, I'm too bad of a person. Nobody would ever love me. Pride. Also called false humility. Um, oh, I, I, I just can't believe in God because I, so many bad things have happened to me in life. Pride. Uh, see what I mean? It, it, it's, it's prideful attitude is something that lifts yourself up. Regardless of whether you think that you're being high and mighty or whether you think that you're being low and, and forgotten, it's still a prideful attitude. Um, so also, whenever you're doing ministry, avoid Christian words. These are things like sanctified. Well, what does that mean? Justified. Well, what does that mean? Salvation. What does that mean? So, I mean, we're, we're reaching the people in America who are not necessarily post-Christian. They're pre-Christian. Remember, America was founded with the idea, America, was founded with the idea of, of immigration. It was founded with the idea of, of no set people. I mean, the people who were here, the Native Americans, were kind of just boop, pushed out and given, told to live on these little, you know, I, I mean, that's just about tragic. You know, Native Americans were, were, were people who enjoyed, you know, moving around the, the country, the the, the continent i guess you could say really within the country at that time they, they got to you know travel around with, 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 to different places as, as the different needs arose at different times of year and stuff and now they're forced to live on well now they can leave the, i mean they can leave the reservations but i mean we've given these them these tiny little plots of land and half the plots of lands land that we've given them are pieces of crap I mean, it's like, well, here's a nice piece of land. Let's keep that for ourselves, and let's give them this plaque of just ugly out in the middle of nowhere. Okay, I'm getting off topic again. Um, but anyways, Christian words. You know, and also we need to realize that different people come from different backgrounds. Let's say somebody comes from the satanic background, and they get saved. They're going to understand differently than someone who came from an atheistic background and got saved, or someone who came from a Catholic background that... Let me reword that. That makes it sound like I don't think Catholics are saved. I think in, in my community, this is how it goes in my community. People say that they're Catholic when they don't go to Mass. They don't, they don't believe in anything. They don't read their Bibles or pray or anything. They just kind of think that they were born into it. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about actual Catholics, okay? So, whew, I said that wrong. But anyways, um, we have all these people coming from these different backgrounds, and do they know that it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do they know that? Do they know that prayer um, prayer is, is beneficial for a righteous person? Do they know this? Do they know what it means to be um, to be free from sin? Does it, do they know what it means to be saved, to be justified, to, you know, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have the Lord touch you? Does, do they know these things? So drop the Christian lingo. Think of how we do announcements. Christians come, I mean, new people come into our church and we say, oh, talk to Larry about this or talk to this person about this. Who are these people? You know what I mean? Or or we, we separate all, all of our different things. Oh, the kids, they're not really a part of the church. They're over there. Then we have our youth. They're not a part of our church either. They're over here. 
this is only for the people between this age and this age, and they're, you know, whatever. This is the church of tomorrow, and this is the church of today. No, we are the church of today. All of us. We're not a country club. We're a hospital for the hurting. Never forget that, okay? A country club has, has strict policies on, 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 on membership. It has strict policies on how to live ways. What we do in the Christian church today is we go to two, two extremes. We either become Judaizers or we become Greeks. Okay, and let me clarify. In Paul's day, there were two kind of people who were um, kind of making a stink in the church. The first were called Judaizers. These were people that thought that you had to fulfill the law. You had to follow Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. You had to follow them perfectly to be saved. Okay. Then there were the other people who were the Greek people who just said, you know, um, you can live however you want. This is exactly what's happening today. Again, it's like repeated history. Oh, 2,000 years ago, and it's happening again. And it's the exact same thing. We're getting into this idea that... We're getting into this idea that it's one or the other. Once again, balance. We talked about this a lot. Have balance, okay? Have balance. You can find a midway point between those two extremes. Um, ministry is service. Ministry is loving people. The majority of your ministry will not happen in the four walls of the church. The majority of your ministry will happen after the service, when you're on your way home and you run into that guy on the street. Or when you stop by the hospital to visit someone who's in your congregation who's dying, and as you're walking out the door, you find another person. See what I mean? Or when you're in the store and you're in a hurry and you're just not really into it, it's your day off, whatever, and you run into somebody hurting on the curb as you're going, running out the store trying to make it to your car. That's ministry. Ministry is when you're having a pro having that problem person that just won't leave you alone and they're just causing such a stink in the church. That's ministry. That is your ministry. See, people don't get in the way of your ministry. They are your ministry. How you handle things, how you react to things, how you conduct yourself at family reunions. These kinds of things are the ministry. Okay? So, ministry is about service. Um. So uh, we should be respectful and, and honor people. Um, our, our parents should be people who we always respect and honor. Um, people always ask me this about obeying. How long do I end time out from my parents' authority? That kind of stuff. I already kind of touched on this about if you're married, your wife is, or your spouse or husband or whatever is your um, uh, authority. Okay. But with that being said, um, we are called to always honor our mother and father. Now, we talked about what honoring is in a, the authority lesson. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to obey everything that they say, but realize that if you have a contentious spirit, that that's not honoring them. Oh, she told me to do that, and you know what? I'm not under her authority anymore. Well, see, that would be a contentious spirit. Um, okay. So uh, let's talk about some of the resources. The biggest resources, the first is this book right here. It's called Systematic Theology. Okay. It's by Wayne Grudem. Um, he, he's a Calvinist, which I don't agree with Calvinism, but I mean, it is very biblically rooted, very, very biblically firm. I, I think that um, I think that he really did a great um, benefit to the church in this work. Um, it's not to say that it's dumbed down or anything, but it's very simple to understand. And he even has a shorter version, in case you're not that big into theology, as you can tell, it has over a thousand pages. Um, he has a shorter version, which is called, I think it's just called Bible Doctrines, um, but I'm not positive. Um, it's somewhere like that. If you just look up Wayne Gruden, you'll be able to find it. Um, really a great resource for, for, for people who just want to know more about theology, to know what to believe and why. Um, another source that I used is the Men's Manual, Volume 1 and 2, by Bill Gothard. Um, I'll talk about Bill Gothard in just a second. And this one, Institute and Basic Youth Conflicts. See, a lot of the things that we're dealing with, when you're dealing with people with addiction, a lot of times they won't be as mature as their age would imply. Same with alcoholics. Same with, with people who are into that kind of lifestyle. Um, it, it's something you can't get frustrated about. It's something you just have to reach them where they're at. Okay? Um, and so I know it seems institute and basic youth conflicts, but still the things that we struggle with as kids become what we struggle with as adults. See what I mean? It has direct carryover. And and we're just older forms of our kids and kids self. I mean, 
we struggle with the same things, the things that impacted us as, a ki as kids are still with us to today. And sometimes we don't face things as a kid, and we have to learn to do it as an adult. Um, but with that being said, um, you, you really do do have a lot. There's a lot of different things there that are very applicational to all ages. Um, but we did have an. Inf uh, this class was written to disciple and train people, not give them theology course, but disciple them, theology in action, basically. Um, people who are into drugs, who are you know divorced, who are who are poor. A large majority of this was written for for that kind of uh, uh, people. Okay. Uh, Obviously, for mixed races, um, whites, Mexicans, other other uh, Hispanic and Latino, uh, Latin American um, groups. Um, so it, other sources would be uh, you can look up Daryl Bach, Paul Little, um, <clears throat> Mark Middleberg, um, um, Mark Roberts. Uh, Really, a lot of different books like that are just just great, um, just great for this kind of stuff. Um, so those are the majority of the re resources that we used. I really depended on Bill Gothard a lot. So let me talk about Bill Gothard. Okay, so in 2014, he was he was accused of, of some stuff with well, quite a few girls. Um, obviously, there's no uh, we can't know absolutely one way or another. And I've already written two blogs about this. Um, where I stand is that. Um, we need to get more evidence before we completely believe it, but we also need to stand up for the rights of the girls, too. There it does need to be a middle ground there. We don't need to go into two extremes. Um, this is one thing that I was talking about here. Okay, so let's say someone is a, is a child monster, okay? And, you know, 200 years ago, people, women didn't make it long past 12 or 13, maybe 15 or 16, and they were married. See what I mean? And it was totally normal for the man who married them to be, you know, 30, 40 years old. But nowadays, that's called child molestation. Okay, now I want to I want to point something out here. I'm not condoning it. I'm not condemning it. All that I'm saying is standards change throughout the years. And we need to be submitted to the reality of how the world is today. In today's society, women are considered women when they turn 18, not before. And we need to honor that. Um, and if you're having problems with, with that kind of stuff, you need to definitely seek help before you do something. Definitely seek help before you do something. Um, just don't hang around kids. I mean, goodness sakes, if you have a problem with that kind of stuff, just don't hang around them. Um, but whatever you need to do, refrain from that kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. Your life will be shot. That kid's life will be shot. Any chance of ministry that you had will be shot. I mean, that's just a terrible thing to do. Um, and, you know, don't forget that the things that we do to kids stay with them their entire lives. Never forget that they learn how to be a person by us. And if we take advantage of that and manipulate a child, I mean, that's a pretty low. That's a pretty big low. Um, and so we need to stand up for kids and we need to stand up for the rights. But also keep in mind that Paul talked about how you shouldn't believe every claim where two or three are gathered. If someone makes a claim against a, a pastor or a minister, you need to um, have one person who can be attested, or, or I mean people who can be attested of their character, or uh, one person who has witnesses. Either of these things would, would, would work. Um, but we need to be careful that we don't condemn everyone. But keep in mind that in today's media-oriented culture, it's very difficult to... Um, to not get the truth out. I mean, let's say, for instance, he just accuses he didn't even kind of sort of get anywhere close to this, okay, which things aren't looking good for him, okay? Things just aren't looking good. Um, but let's say that that's, that that's the way it is. Um, in today's media culture, it would be best for him to step down anyways and to stay out of ministry anyways because the media has a way of doing that, okay? It, it makes things very uh, public, and we don't want to do anything that would cause someone to lose out on salvation. We don't need to do anything that would hurt the church. Uh, but with that being said, just a few more ideas. I'll come back to the idea of child molestation in just a second. Um, uh, Bill's teachings are still of benefit, regardless of whether or not he messed up or not. Okay. There are false teachers. These are people who pretend to love people, but they don't. Then there are people who mess up. 
Now, these are people who genuinely do love people, but, you know, obviously they fall to sin. And then there are the people who don't fall to sin. Now, I do want to make a few things noted here. Well, no, it's not really important. Well, I'll just move on from that. Um, so, so we need to just be careful and, and, and make sure that we've got all the facts about stuff. Um, and once again, don't miss the point. His teachings are still of value. Um, and even though this came from a, what people would call a poisoned water hole, compare it to the word. Compare it to the word. See if these things actually cause people to come out of sin. Come out of life. Come out of a life of sin. Okay, because these are the things that, that I learned when I was a kid, and it helped me enormously. And for those people who, who are able to take this up, um, it, it helps them out enormously. Um, it, it, learning about theology is one thing. Learning about how theology applies to us is something completely different. Um, so, uh, now about child molestation, though, um, just because it's not in the law, does that make does that make it? Um, Okay, no, our consciences testify about how that is wrong, right? Paul talks about this. Um, I was just saying that, you know, yeah. I guess my point was just simply that in today's culture, that's not okay anymore. And so, but with that being said, we do need to be careful about who we look down on. I mean, obviously, I already mentioned this, but let's say, for instance, a 19-year-old, you know, has relations with a 17-year-old. I mean, that's only two years, but still it's legal. See what I mean? So sometimes, thing, or, I mean, it, it, like if you've ever seen the movie Horrible Bosses, the guy takes a leak in a park, and so he's charged as a sex offender. Um, but he didn't actually do anything with a child. See what I mean? So just because someone's branded that doesn't mean that we need to instantly hate them. All that my point is is that how we, how we look down on people. Oh, child molesters this. Well, just never forget that 200 years ago that wasn't wrong for them to do that. Okay. We're not talking about them touching a, a two-year-old. We're talking about people who are doing doing things with a 16 or 17 year old. Not that that's right. I still think that that's wrong. But I'm just saying, keep in mind that 200 years ago, that wasn't wrong. Okay. Whereas the things that we justify are oftentimes just as bad. Do you like a porn? That's bad. Okay. You are taking advantage of a woman's body. You are seeing her as less than a person. Yes, when you look at porn, you stop seeing people as real people. You start seeing them as objects. Fact. When you start looking at porn, you are cheating on your wife. Fact. Or your girlfriend. Whatever. Okay? When you do these things, that is wrong too. But what we do is we say, that's a bigger sin and I can live in my sin. What are you doing? You're comparing yourself to others. You're comparing yourself to yourself. Not to Christ. Christ said, if you so much as think, you are doing something wrong. See what I mean? So, um, also I hope you guys notice the repeating themes. Um, pride w was a big repeating theme. Um, um, uh, finances and stewardship was a big repeating theme. Um, we talked about how theology applies in different ver in, in, in different contexts, in different scenarios. Uh, like for instance, how pride pride goes in different things. And sometimes we wouldn't even necessarily say pride, but we talk about the effects of pride. And oftentimes laziness can be an effect of pride. So, um, so we talked about the Bible. We talked about salvation. We talked about God. We talked about finances. We talked about church function. We talked about the outreach. We talked about responsibility, conscience, lifestyle, reinvention, how to keep growing and maturing in the faith, uh, seeking God, and authority. Um, so the ten values which protect families from destructive influences. I'm going to close with this, um, or I'm going to have this in the closing, I should say. Um, God alone is sovereign, the Bible says inspired word, and the final authority for my life. My purpose in life is to seek God with my whole heart and to build my goals around his priorities. You know, I do want to say one more thing, um, I, just to make sure that we don't lose track of what I was saying here. Um, I said about how child molestation is not anywhere in, in, in the law. Okay. For those people who say things like, the Bible doesn't say anything that about I can't I can't smoke a marijuana or something like that, or I can't get drunk or whatever, well, maybe you aren't looking close enough. Because it doesn't say anything about child molestation either. Does that mean that it's saying it's okay to touch a child? No. It's not saying that at all. Okay? And let me be perfectly clear. Just because I think that we shouldn't rush to the rush to the conviction of, of a minister. Who is convicted? Who, who not convicted of it, but accused of it? And just think, and just because I'm telling you not to hold yourself in pride against someone else who's messed up, does not mean that I'm in any way condoning child molestation. 
Okay, there are certain things that are are pretty freaking low, and child molestation is pretty freaking low. If you've done it in the past, get help, and stay away from kids, and don't do it again in the future. Make sure you you you, you hold yourself to that standard. Okay. Fact. Um, I, I strongly believe that people who do things like that should should be um, should be punished for those kinds of things. Child and children are innocent. They're naive. They're um, you know, it goes against everything in the Bible. Okay. Not only that, but if you would hold off until marriage to have sex, this would resolve a lot of these issues. Um, but so just to make sure that I that I'm clear here. Okay. Child molestation is is pretty pretty low, and make sure that you don't ever justify it um, in your own life or in somebody else's life. God alone is sovereign, and the Bible is his inspired word, and the fine authority for my life. We talked about that. My purpose in life is to seek God with my whole heart and to build my goals around his priorities. My body is a living temple of God and must not be defiled by the lust of the world. These are things that will protect our families from destructive influence, so that will guide them. Okay, Wrongful habits, uh, wrongful motives. Um, my church must teach the foundational truths of the Bible and reinforce my basic convictions rather than appealing to what feels good. My children and grandchildren belong to God, and it is my responsibility to teach those scriptural principles, godly character, and basic convictions. My activities must never weaken the scriptural convictions of another Christian. My marriage is a lifelong commitment to God and to my spouse. My money is a trust from God and must be earned and managed according to scriptural principles. Okay, stop and, and, and stop stop this video and, and just go through these things. My words must be in harmony with God's word, especially when reproving and restoring your Christian brother. My affections must be set on things above, not on things in the earth. And as we study, learn to have a lesson applies to you, not others. This is the heart. This is the heart of what we studied throughout this course. Okay, that was the heart of it. Um, go back and if I can get my pointer, there we go. Go back and go through those things one by one. I mean, just really, that is the heart of this class. So these, once again, are, are the resources that I used. Um, I used a lot of the NASB and NIV, uh, 2011 NIV, not the one from the 80s. I always bought it from another company, and it really is a, is a really good translation now. Um, I used a lot from Mark Roberts, Paul Little, Craig Blomberg, Bruce Rustall, Darren Doherty, um, FF Bruce. Um, check these people out. Uh, Basic Youth Conflicts by Bill Gothard, Men's Manual by Bill Gothard. Um, Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem, as well as just experience from from drug addicts and that kind of stuff. So um, I do want to um, go. There were a few slides that, that were missed in the in this in the things. This was one of them. It was in the church function, and this was an example. Moses was called to lead. That was his his special calling. Aaron was called as a priest. That was his special calling. Bezalel and Aholiab were called to make things. That was their special calling. But all of Israel was called to be holy. That was their general calling. Okay, so be humble in spirit focuses on God and serving others. That's ministry, being humble in spirit. Not everyone receives a burning bush calling. Sometimes we have this idea that we're going to have this super um, spiritual, mystical light that comes down from above. It just doesn't really happen like that. I mean, it's that would be nice, but it just doesn't. Um, so, and then lastly, what is my obligation to authority? This is something that I missed from lesson 12. Um, I don't know how I must, it must just skip right past it. Um, so, um, obey them, um, unless, you know, well, yeah, obey them, okay? Your wife, don't just, oh, I'm the head of this household, no, she's an equal voice, you need to, you know, obey and whatnot. Uh, um, no, once again, I'm not talking about dominance, once again, don't get lost in, in stuff, don't assume that I'm saying something that I'm not saying, um, and don't take what I'm saying out of context, like the thing with the, uh, Bill Gothard. Um, I know some people would take that and say, he's saying it's okay to be a child molester. Didn't say that at all. In fact, I made sure to clarify that afterwards. He's saying that we should let child molesters scot-free as long as they're ministers. Nope, didn't say that at all. See, I mean, don't assume what I said. Listen to what I actually said. Oh, well, that is implying, is it, though? Is he really implying that? Um, uh, secondly, pray for their well-being. Oh, I didn't vote for that Obama. It's President Obama. That's, that's actually his title, President Obama. Okay, and oh well, I heard he's gonna do this, and he's gonna, he's gonna but that's mostly probably rumor, probably rumor. So pray for their well-being, pray for them. You know, they actually praying for someone if it hurts. Um, you shouldn't be praying for someone. Oh God, strike them down. But with that being said, we do need to be careful as those in authority. Um, 
the Bible mentions those people who call out to the Lord when they're being oppressed and the bad things that happen to them. So just be careful that you're not persecuting people under you. Um, once again, um, children, the innocent. Okay, we should be standing up for the innocent, not taking advantage of them. That's pretty sick. Um, control your thoughts, actions, and words. Now, hold on. I want to stop here. When we fall this in, God wants us to remember it long enough to to um, to change from it, but not long enough to to guilt trip ourselves over. Oh, I, I, 40 years ago, I, I was I was convicted of a child of child molestation or something like that. Okay, for instance, um, if you have changed and you've been saved, you're a new creation. Um, obviously, you should probably stay away from kids. Whatever ministry you have in the future probably should have nothing to do with kids, not even remotely, obviously. However, and that does not mean that God is done with you, and there are still plenty of opportunities that you can um, use. For instance, you know, hey, um, I, I used to have a problem with this, but God's freed me of that. Um, but uh, in other words, I'm not trying to guilt trip people who have done things like that. Really not. But it does need to be remembered that these things are wrong. When we fall to sin, we oftentimes try to justify our way out, way out. It's not that bad. No, it is that bad. And you need to never forget that it is that bad. The minute we forget how bad our sin is, the moment we fall back into it. Never forget that. Anybody can fall. Anybody can fall. Okay, never think, I'm so in high and mighty, I'm so powerful. No, anybody can fall. Anybody can cheat on their wife. Anybody. Control your thoughts, actions, and words to be of benefit to them. Okay, are you hearing what I'm saying? What is my obligation to authority? Control your thoughts, actions, and words to be of benefit to them. Not to harm them. Don't say things. Don't do things that will harm them. Work for their best interest. Your boss, for instance. Do not say or think cutting remarks. Do not harbor resentment. Don't join with other people who are harboring resentment. Don't hang around people who you know have a problem with them. Don't uh, go out of your way to say dumb things to them. See what I mean? There's just a lot of things that we need to be careful about with authority. And um, we're going to go ahead and stop there. Um, if you have any questions, post it below. That is the end of the deception course. Um, remember, mercy is given, judgment is given without mercy to those um, who have shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Never forget that. But also never forget that um, we need to stand up for justice and for righteousness. So, um, I hope you learned something from this course. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, I hope that you did not take anything that I said out of context about Child Station or Bill Gothard. Um, really hope you don't. Um, or if you do, look at my heart and know what I meant when I said something, okay? I know sometimes we, oh, well, he said this, but I didn't mean that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I maybe stumbled over my words. I maybe didn't say it in a very good way. Like, for instance, some people would watch this and say, he's anti-Catholic. I tried to show that I'm not, um, you know, but, um, well, I hope you get what I'm saying. Um, that's the end of this deception course, uh, Growing in Christ. Hopefully you'll, you've learned something that will help you grow in Christ. And never stop seeking. Never stop seeking. Never stop seeking.